Hi, welcome to Pold House Workshops video series. Before I get started with this video, I wanted to make a quick note that there are plenty more sharpening videos on the way. They're all in various stages of production, but they are coming. Uh, the next one you'll see is on powered sharpening, which includes the grinding wheel and the WorkSharp 3000, plus a couple other little tidbits I've managed to cram in there. Um, then I'll get into some specific videos uh, for tool sharpening from beginning to finish uh, for a specific tool. Uh, the first one of those will be axe and hatchet sharpening. We'll do a knife and razor sharpening. Then there will be carving and wood turning tools, which includes how to make a leather slip strop specific to tool shapes. There will be uh, plenty more videos other than those, including an entire series on hand saws uh, and hand saw sharpening. Uh, and that will include the use and care of those tools as well. On my blog, uh, I've now started an entire page dedicated to sharpening, which has references to all of my other videos. There are accompanying write-ups, um, some additional information, charts, graphs, um, and some, some other photos and write-ups as well, so please feel free to check that out. As we're moving through some of the other sharpening videos, if there's a method that I haven't talked about, um, please shoot me an email if it's something you'd like to see, and I'll see what I can do about putting together a specific video for that. This video that we're about to jump into is on hand planes, uh, the use and care of these amazing hand tools. So let's get started. Almost all known modern hand tools, uh, and for all intents and purposes the majority of modern power tools, date back through their long family trees to some of the earliest knives. The earliest and most crude knives were made of things like bone and wood and, and uh, stone, uh, most frequently flint that they've uh, managed to find. Um, but as man began to become uh, a little more adept at tool use and tool making, he started varying the number of those uh, knife blades and the size and shape of those to create some different tools. You can imagine uh, a whole bunch of these blades stuck to a long piece of wood with some tar or pitch. Uh, that would start to resemble something like a saw. In fact, they've uncovered an extremely ancient saw that was nothing more than sharp pieces of flint adhered to a piece of wood with some, uh, some pitch that, uh, when rubbed over the surface, something would at least abrade it, if not cut it very well. Um, throughout time, uh, man started varying the size and shape of a single blade to begin to resemble something more like this chisel. Uh, especially with the advent of metallurgy, these tools became much more utilitarian, uh, more durable, they were able to put a sharper edge, and uh, more fine things were able to be made and uh, created with these tools. The basic concept behind a hand plane is really nothing more than to take this chisel blade cram it into a piece of wood at a certain fixed or adjustable as the case may be angle to present this blade uh, to the surface of the wood at an optimum angle for shearing the wood's fibers. Um, some of the earliest and most crude planes were nothing more than a log with a flat side roughly hewn, uh, an angled mortise where this uh, chisel blade or a thick blade would rest and then crammed in with a, a wooden wedge just enough to keep the blade from moving as it was dragged across the surface of the wood. As you can imagine, some of the most early hand planes uh, probably resembled a much less refined version of this Wade Butcher coffin plane, basically just a wooden body with the uh, wooden wedge that we talked about, and a metal blade. Um, you know, the blade is pinched in with this wedge and it protrudes through the bottom just enough to shear the top of the wood fibers. Today, however, we know and love this uh, Stanley Bailey similar patent. Uh, this is a Stanley Bailey number four. But uh, originally, Mr. Uh, Leonard Bailey patented his first metal bodied planes in 1858. He was only 23 years old when he patented his first set. And Stanley saw fit, uh, saw enough potential and saw fit in these hand planes to purchase them, which really at the time was kind of a gamble because they were so new to a lot of craftsmen 
uh, who were used to the wooden bodied uh, style hand planes. Stanley, with their uh, infinite wisdom initially, bought this um, and then made some initial quick adjustments to it. And then, as time proceeded, managed to add some of the niceties and the uh, little features that we know today. And we'll go through some of those uh, in this initial video, and I'll get into some more detail on dating hand planes in another video. Almost all of my antique hand planes are users. Uh, I really don't have much use personally for a collector's item, um, but there is a, uh, a growing number of people out there who are into collecting antique hand tools, and we'll get into some specific methods for, for dating and, uh, and restoring or cleaning up some antique hand tools uh, in some other videos. But I did want to go over some of the bits and pieces of the basic hand plane in this initial video. If you would like to get into dating hand planes or you're going to go shopping somewhere for a hand plane, say an antique store or a flea market, uh, there are some excellent websites out there for dating and pricing a hand plane, uh, specifically Stanley's, that I'll post links to on my blog. Um, there's a couple of them that are really good resources, whether you're going to buy a collector or not. As I stated before, this hand plane is a Stanley Bailey patent number four uh, metal body. There's a, a couple of features that we'll get into here uh, is the, the front bun or the front knob. And this is an easy way to really quickly date your hand plane. Um, keep in mind that a lot of these items are interchangeable, they break over time, so uh, what you may be looking at to date your hand plane might not be original to the plane. So it, it pays to know a lot of the other little features uh, to really accurately date one. But this front bun, as you'll notice on this hand plane, uh, prior to 1922 they were kind of low and squatty like this. After 1922, Stanley put on this higher, uh, more pronounced front bun. This is the real rear tote or handle. Um, a lot of these are, are rosewood um, on some of the older Stanleys, um, but a lot of, of woods have been uh, substituted over the years. Um, but I would check if you're looking to buy one of these and make sure if, uh, if you're not real comfortable in making one, just check and make sure that they're on there sturdy and that they're uh, in fairly decent shape. Uh, putting new finish on them for a user uh, hand plane is not really a big deal. Some of the little bits and pieces here as we go through this hand plane, we've got the obviously the sides to the hand plane, the sole or base of the hand plane, We've got the throat, which is the opening through which the blade protrudes. On top, we've got our lever cap, which is held down by this little lever. Wow, amazing. Um, which releases with a forward pressure. Basically, the concept behind this is to just pinch the blade and the chip breaker to the frog and into the body of the plane. Um, this is obviously an extremely important part of the hand tool, so if you're coming across uh, an antique hand tool that you're shopping for and this is extremely badly damaged, you might either want to try to find a replacement or move on to the next hand tool. Keep in mind that if some of these hand tools you're shopping for are extremely rusty uh, to the point where the metal is flaking off, they're deeply pitted, uh, or some parts are broken or mangled beyond repair, there are a lot of other hand tools out there, uh, specifically hand planes. There, there are a lot of fish in the sea, so maybe move on to the next one if it looks like it's beyond repair for you. Um, this uh, lever cap is in pretty decent condition. Here's another little quick way to date your Stanley hand plane. The uh, keyhole changed in 1933 to this little kidney shape from this keyhole shape. So prior to 1933 they looked like this and after 1933 they uh, were given this key, uh, this kidney shape. Another thing to look for on your lever cap is a, uh, a fairly true or decent edge along this, this front bit here uh, as that applies some pressure additionally to the lever cap. Underneath oftentimes you'll find a patent number so sometimes 
that may uh, be datable to your plane body. Underneath the lever cap, we get into the chip breaker and blade assembly. So we've got a little screw that holds these together. On the back, the screw comes out. We'll set that aside. We've got our blade. For this plane, it has this large keyhole shape in the center. This is something to keep in mind when you're sharpening your blades, is that this huge void in the middle can sometimes cause these to flex a little bit. So it's just something to be aware of when you're sharpening your blade, is that you can really quickly get a concave or convex shape, uh, depending on how much pressure you're applying at, at this back portion. It'll deform the front of the blade a little bit. The oh-so-important chip breaker. And on a, uh, a bench-style plane like this, with the bevel of the blade down, um, which is typical of bench planes, this chip breaker becomes extremely important. It applies pressure along this front edge and along the back of the chip breaker onto your blade, which reduces uh, chatter in the blade, the vibration that happens when you drag it across the surface of wood. It holds the blade firm and applies uh, pressure along the front cutting edge, uh, which uh, almost adds mass to the blade itself without having to put a really thick blade on there. The uh, front leading edge here is important to be flat, straight, and actually a little bit sharp. Um, if it's not perfect in the plane you happen to be shopping for or looking at, it's fixable. So it's not totally a deal breaker unless it's mangled beyond repair. And uh, in the video on fettling planes, which will probably be the next one, I'll go over how to repair and tune up your uh, chip breaker. Um, the other purpose for the chip breaker is, as its name implies, to roll the wood shavings up and away from the blade in the body of the plane. So as the chip comes up through the throat of the plane, it will come across this bumped surface and peel away from the blade. So it'll help reduce uh, clogging in the throat and keep blades, or uh, rather keep the, uh, the chips and the shavings from clogging back up into the hand plane. All right, below the blade and chip breaker assembly, we've got the frog. Now the frog is this large metal piece which beds directly into the base of the plane. Now if you're looking for a hand plane, this is a great place to check for excessive rust, um, pitting, um, repairs on the hand plane often can be seen from the inside here. Um, and if, if the uh, inside here is really too badly rusted or damaged, it might be time to move on to another hand plane uh, unless you think you can either repair it or you feel comfortable in replacing it with a similar one. So the uh, frog on this style hand plane is held down by a couple of screws which are easily removable. So we pull these bad boys out and the frog comes on out. Maybe. Comes out. There we go. The frog comes out. So you see on the uh, frog assembly here on the top, you've got a hold down screw, which is adjustable. Uh, so if you're having too much trouble forcing the lever cap down, you might want to loosen this screw slightly. Um, or if it's if the lever cap is not tightening down the blade and the chip breaker assembly enough, you can tighten this down a little bit. This uh, lateral adjuster, this long piece here, this was uh, added to the Stanley um, model planes in 1885 uh, and then the uh, little friction disc on the front here was added in 1888. So the friction disc basically allows the blade assembly to ride across the lateral adjuster without uh, rubbing too heavily on the back side of the lateral adjuster or the, the top end of the frog. So on the back here we have the adjuster knob which moves the blade in and out by action of this little knob here 
that sits inside the corresponding shaped hole on your chip breaker. So as you turn this knob, that little piece in there goes back and forward, moving the blade in and out. There is an adjuster for the frog position here. It's a small screw with a, uh, a fixed nut on it and a yoke on the frog which slips over that nut. And as you loosen or tighten that screw, it moves the frog forward or backward in the body of the plane. Now, on non-adjustable throat planes, so where this is a fixed throat, this is a way to tighten or uh, broaden your, your throat. So you would, if it's uh, too much space in front of the blade, you're getting a lot of tear out or it's jamming, and you've backed the blade up so you know it's, it's just barely protruding, you should be getting a good cut, you can move the frog forward a little bit to tighten up the throat and uh, allow you to take a finer shaving. Um, on the other hand, if it's taking too fine a shaving or it's clogging really, really, uh, really bad, you can back the frog off a little bit. But once you get it adjusted the first time, you really shouldn't have to mess with the uh, front to back adjustment of the frog. Another thing to look for when shopping for hand planes if you are in a place that would allow you to remove the frog is to look underneath the frog for excessive rust or pitting underneath. Uh, if you're looking for a collector, another thing to note while you've got this disassembled or just from the top view is the amount of japanning left on the inside of the plane. Uh, for a user this isn't critical, uh, it can be cleaned up or scraped off if you really want to. Um, again in, in another restoration video I'll show you how to do some actual japanning um, there's a there's a spray on a method uh, which we'll go over, um, but also a true japanning which is an asphaltic mix um, that you can apply to the hand planes. All right, so to put this back, seat the frog into the body. And then I would tighten the screws down just so that they bite. Uh, don't hork them down all the way. Then you can set in the chip breaker and blade. And remember, in these bench planes, the bevel of the blade faces down. Put the screw back on. Make sure we get this screw good and tight. Alright, now something to keep in mind uh, as you're reassembling your blade and chip breaker assembly is to keep the edge of the chip breaker between a 32nd and a 16th of an inch uh, away from the edge of your blade. Now when these blades go into the hand plane, this is a good time to talk about how these planes work. Um, you'll note as the bevel is down and the flat part of the blade is up, whatever angle you have this blade seated at in your plane is the angle that you will be planing, uh, planing the wood with. Now, some companies like Lee Nielsen uh, have some interchangeable frogs that are different angles for some of their hand planes. So for a bench style plane where the angle of the frog is your cutting angle, uh, that's a, a real good feature to have. There also are manufacturers, um, uh, Ron Hawk, Mr. Rob Kosman, uh, Pinnacle, Lee Nielsen, a, a lot of manufacturers out there who make a thicker blade for these style hand planes, uh, really for any of the antique Stanleys. Um, so that's something to consider if uh, you're noting, noticing you're getting a lot of chatter with your hand plane, even though you've gone through and checked your chip breaker and the uh, lever cap assembly, your frog is seated correctly, uh, it might be uh, wise of you to maybe take a look at investing in a thicker blade um, because chatter shouldn't really occur uh, that bad especially in some of these nice pre-World War II Stanley hand planes. Alright so we set the blade assembly back in, put the lever cap back on, and tighten it down. Now I want to check through the throat of my plane here uh, with the blade, check the blade is just barely protruding so you can sight down 
the sole like this to see if the blade is just protruding through. Uh, some, some people like to feel, um, or some people will even set it on a piece of wood and drag it while turning the rear adjustment knob until it bites and then you know it's poking through. Uh, there's a lot of ways to sight this through. I like to look down the body of the plane. I'm just poking through and then I check the throat clearance from the front or the, the top end of this throat to the cutting edge of my blade and that is also between a sixteenth and a thirty second so I should be good there. Now uh, I can tighten or loosen that remember with this rear adjustment knob uh, or the, the uh, frog adjustment screw rather if I notice that I'm getting a lot of tear out or it's clogging too poorly I can go one way or the other. But I look good here so I'll remove this and the blade assembly now you can hork down the screws. So make sure I get those good and tight because I don't want this assembly slipping on me halfway through planing. So now that I've got that set, once you get that set you really shouldn't have to fiddle with it too much, uh, especially if you're typically uh, using the same blade in your hand plane. Alright, so now I put lever cap back on and I'm set to go. <clears throat> Something to keep in mind with uh, with some of these hand planes is that you want the lever cap to be tight but not so tight that you can't also move your rear adjustment knob. So I want to be able to move the blade in and out with that uh, tightened down. Now there are some modern plane makers that, uh, and, and some, some actually North style infill planes that you don't want to do that with. Um, so just kind of be careful, maybe do a little research on your specific hand plane to make sure that that's okay, but with the, uh, the old school Stanleys, that's a way to go. I wanted to make a quick note here about the difference between a bench style hand plane and a block plane. Um, block planes often are much smaller like this um, than the bench planes, however that's not really the only difference. Um, block planes have a lot of the similar features. Uh, this little one from Lee Nielsen has has got the uh, adjustment knob on the top here to add pressure to your blade. Um, it's got the adjustment knob in the back here with the fixed nut and a mortised slot on the back of the blade in which that nut sits so that the blade can move back and forth. But the biggest difference here is that the blade sits bevel up. So the bevel of this blade, obviously by name, sits facing the sky in the plane. Uh, this makes a difference because not only do you have the angle of the bed of the plane for you know how the blade sits in there, but you also have your bevel angle to consider when uh, calculating your cutting angle. So it's good to note that if you have, uh, you know, say a 15 degree or a 12 degree uh, bed in your plane, and then you've got a 40 degree bevel on your uh, on your blade, you would have 40 or 45 degrees or 30 degrees, whatever the bevel angle happens to be, plus the angle of the bed of your plane, which you know, 12, 15, 20, 25, whatever it happens to be. The difference uh, with the block plane, as we discussed earlier, is that the angle of the frog that's seated into the base of the plane is your cutting angle. So the, the angle at which your blade sits in there uh, is the angle you'd be considering for cutting. The nice thing about um, some of these block planes is that uh, you can adjust the angle you're cutting at uh, just by grinding a new angle on your blade or having a couple of blades of, of varying degrees on their bevel. I also thought it might make sense to give a quick primer on uh, how plan hand planes work in the order you should use them, typically. So let's say we've got this nifty demonstration board here. Uh, just a basic piece of pine, nothing fancy. Um, when you're ready to use your hand planes, basically what you'd be doing is uh, you know, trying to mill this edge flat or the face of the board flat, in which case it would obviously be laying face down. So 
on a, uh, a rough board or something out of the stockpile, the edge, uh, obviously exaggerated for demonstration purposes, looks something like this. Now, if I were to start off straight away with my, my small number four or this even smaller number three, uh, or even, you know, something tiny and novelty size, this plane would tend to want to ride the ridges of, uh, of each of those imperfections in the edge. So, rather than start with this short plane, I would start with something more like this joiner, which would tend to span all the high spots, would, would span across the high spots and uh, beyond the low spots. So as I ride this plane across the surface of this wood, it would begin to level out some of these high spots until they met the low spots without riding along all those humps and bumps. So once I was taking consistent shaving all the way across the board with the joiner, I would move to something maybe more like this uh, Lee Nielsen number 62 low angle uh, jack plane, which is a little bit shorter. So it would, uh, now that I've taken out the most severe humps and bumps with my joiner, I would take this across the edge and smooth the edge even more. Now this plane is also extremely good for roughing out um, face playing on, on lumber and uh, I'll get into some detailed methods and procedures for hand planing in a uh, methods and procedures video. But uh, basic concept, this, blade, this uh, hand plane has got a number of different blades available from Lee Nielsen um, and I, I'm not sponsored or paid by them at all. I just I really like this hand plane. If you notice on my blog, I have a couple write-ups about it. It really is a uh, please pardon the term, but a jack of all trades. It does a lot of things really well, um, but it's not a specific hand plane for a specific purpose. Uh, they've got a 90 degree blade, which is basically just a blade with a flat edge that's good for scraping. Uh, and because it's a low angle in the style of a block plane. It sits bevel up, it's got this nice thick blade. So I can put different angle blades in there and get different results. Um, it's got an adjustable throat, which is also nice. It comes with uh, this, this blade here, uh, which I believe was 25 degrees. Um, but you can also get several other blades that you can grind to varying bevel angles. It also has a tooth blade option, which is good for rough, uh, real fast removal. Um, so if, if I was going to start with, with one hand plane, I would start with this, uh, or something similar in the antique world. Uh, this plane needs a, a tune-up, it's fairly new, is this Stanley Bedrock number 605. Um, now Stanley, the, the bedrocks are a little more expensive uh, as they're sought after by collectors, especially these flat-sided ones, which you'll notice that uh, Lee Nielsen models a lot of their hand planes after the, the bedrock style. Um, but the flat-sided ones are a little more sought after than the round-sided bedrocks, uh, so they're a little bit more expensive. But Stanley also made just a straight number five, a number six, a seven, and an eight, just like that Stanley number eight or the, the Lee Nielsen number eight joiner. Um, these planes are very similar in what they would do in the next step of planing as this low angle joiner or this low angle jack plane. So we would go from say this number six oh five then to something slightly shorter. Um, it's this smoothing plane a number four or even a number three and the smoothing planes as the name implies put a much more smooth edge uh, or face on the wood that you're hand planing. Um, a joiner plane or a low angle number 62 or a 605 can all be uh, used for the same purpose so you can use this uh, 62 or this 605 for smoothing, it's just uh, that this hand plane was specifically made for that task. But uh, with a little bit uh, tighter throat and a nice sharp blade, and in, in this case you can tighten up your throat by adjusting it, you can take a finer shaving. So you can take, 
you know, a thousandth of an inch shaving, just like you can with this uh, smoothing plane, and achieve the same result. Which is why I recommend people start with something about this length if you don't have any other hand planes. So then, obviously, this shorter plane would then ride after you've taken the joiner and your, uh, your mid-range or four plane to the lumber. Then you could take this smoother across, and because you've managed to smooth out a bunch of these humps and bumps, it wouldn't want to ride anymore, so you get a nice smooth edge, and because it's set up as a smoothing plane, you get uh, almost a burnished surface. Now there are specialty planes like uh, scraper planes and card scrapers and a lot of those other things. Um, a lot of times, depending on what you're doing, uh, the smoothing plane will put a finished enough edge on whatever it is you happen to be working on to prepare it for finish. Uh, you can take, the nice thing about hand planes is that uh, if I really want something nice and burnished, I can take a, a card scraper or a scraper plane across the surface and I never have to use sandpaper. So there's, there's no dust, there's uh, much less mess, uh, and, and a lot of these hand planes are very controllable. My intent with these hand tool video sets is to try to demystify some of these antique hand tools. Uh, I feel that they really have a home in just about any shop, from the most CNC-oriented uh, power machine shop to someone's home garage shop. Uh, I feel that they really have uh, a niche that they fill. There's, uh, they're very controllable, they're accurate, they don't create a lot of mess, um, and, and they're really easy to use once you know the ins and outs. Uh, some of these hand tools can also perform tasks in a fraction of the time it would take to set up a power tool. I don't by any means mean to discount power tools, in fact I use a lot of power tools myself. Um, and there will be power tool videos, uh, instruction, care, use, and otherwise included in these video sets uh, for their appropriate hand tool category. Um, but, but I do want to try to, again, demystify some of these tools and prove that they do have a home in your shop. Um, I know for, from experience that having a very small shop, especially something in your house, uh, hand tools can provide a, uh, a really clean and efficient way to do woodworking uh, without all the noise, um, dust, and uh, inconvenience sometimes of power tools. Again, I'd like to note that there are more sharpening videos coming uh, and plenty more hand tool videos coming, including the entire series coming quickly on hand planes. Uh, if you have any questions or concerns, as always, please feel free to email me at poulthouseworkshop at gmail.com. Please visit my blog. It's at uh, poulthouse.com. Obviously, there's the YouTube channel, um, which has these sets of videos included on it. Um, and feel free to comment on both the videos and the blog. Uh, I'd like to hear some feedback. Let me know what you think. And, uh, and I'll keep cranking these things out as much as I can. So thanks for joining me on Pold House Workshop's video series, and I'll see you next time.